So I'm going to introduce our first speaker, the renowned David Hawkins. Sorry. Um, he is an endowed professor of prevention at the University of Washington School of Social Work. He seeks to identify risk and protective factors for behavioral health problems and to understand how these factors interact in the development of healthy behavior and the prevention of problem behaviors. He co-developed the experimentally proven Guiding Good Choices Parenting Program, the Raising Healthy Children Program, and the very renowned Communities That Care Prevention System. Dr. Hawkins is a current member of the board on Children, Youth, and Families, and the Forum on Promoting Children's Cognitive, Effective, and Behavioral Health at the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. And he received his PhD in Sociology from Northwestern University. Thank you, Denny. My father-in-law was an Irish immigrant to this country, and he would introduce me differently if he were here today. What he'd say to you is this, I'd like you to meet my son-in-law, Dave. He's a doctor, but it's not the kind does you any good. <laughs> I'm pleased to say today that we do have doctors that do you good here. We have the president of the American Academy of Pediatrics, Dr. Bernard Dreyer. We have the Vice President of the American Board of Pediatrics, Dr. Laurel Leslie, and we have some incredible pediatric researchers and family practice researchers who you'll be hearing from today. So it's an honor to be in the company of real doctors who do you real good uh, in this presentation today. Um, I, I, we're going to be talking about the costs of behavioral health problems, the power of family-focused programs to prevent them, and the promise of providing these programs through primary health care. I want you to just, how many people are parents? If you're a parent, would you raise your hand? So you know the truth of what I'm about to say, which is parenting is the hardest but most important job we do, and it doesn't come with a manual. I want to just think about what would America be like if all parents were prepared to raise physically and behaviorally healthy children. It's not necessarily what's happening today. In the United States today, Children are expelled from preschool at three times the rate of expulsion or suspension from K through 12 schools. We know that 18% of the kids in preschool are African American kids, but they get expelled or suspended multiple times at the rate of 48%. Uh, this has been going on for a long time, and it's still going on in our society. There are people here from uh, uh, a study that's done, uh, Bettengord is here, and uh, if you would raise your hand, Dr. Bettengord, they've done a study of uh, young people in Baltimore, and they looked at the kids entering kindergarten in Baltimore City Public Schools, and they found that 52% of those children entering school didn't have sufficient social behavioral skills needed to learn. What are social behavioral skills? They're the skills that develop early before children enter school. And they're essential for learning in a classroom setting. Their skills children need to follow directions, to comply with rules, to manage their emotions, to solve problems, to organize and complete tasks, to get along with others. These are the skills that young people need to succeed in elementary school. And what they found is that in Baltimore, when children enter without those skills in kindergarten, they're 80% more likely to be held back in a grade by the end of the fourth grade. They're 80, up to 80% more likely to receive services and supports through an individual education program or a 504 plan, they're seven times more likely to be suspended or expelled at least once in elementary grades. When you're suspended and expelled, it's very difficult to master the material that's being presented in the classroom. We know from a recent report from the Institute of Medicine and the National Research Council that secure and responsive relationships with adults are the foundation for the healthy development of children. And who are the most important adults in children's lives? Their parents, their daily caretakers, the people who put them to bed at night. But we also know from that same report that adults who are under-informed, under under-prepared, or subject to chronic stress themselves may contribute to children's experiences of adversity and stress and undermine their development and learning. And we've learned a lot 
about the effects of these er early psychosocial adversities. They have impacts on the brain and its development, on the regulation of stress response hormone systems, and the calibration of stress reactivity at a variety of levels, from behavioral changes to gene expression responses. What's the result of this? Well, it's behavioral problems. The more we learn about the brain, the more we understand how exposure to multiple risk factors during childhood increases risk for a variety of behavioral health problems. These are not unique phenomena. These are not unique things that occur. Up to 50 parents, almost 50% of young people in America between the ages of 13 and 18 will experience one of these behavioral health problems during their adolescence. And over a fifth of them will actually have severe impairment. It's costly. In 2009, the National Research Council and uh, Institute of Medicine estimated that the cost annually of these behavioral health problems of young people in our society was $247 billion per year. So, what does that mean? Well, parents are primary. They're the first and most important influence on children's health, cognitive, emotional, and behavioral and physical development. How can we assure that all parents are equipped to provide nurturing environments for their children's healthy development and thereby to prevent these behavioral health problems that cause young people to get kicked out of school or suspended or expelled that lost lives and big costs? Well, there's good news, and that comes from prevention science, as Dan Fishbein was mentioning earlier. There are at least 16 family-focused prevention programs that have been tested and proven effective and are ready for use according to the Blueprints for Healthy Youth Development supported by the Annie E. Casey Foundation. Some of these programs are universal programs for all parents, programs for everyone who's about to have a baby, programs for everyone who's about to have an adolescence who wants to prevent that adolescent from becoming involved in substance abuse or delinquency or unwanted teen pregnancy. Some of these are selective programs. They're programs for children exposed to elevated risks, like programs for, for children who are experiencing divorce or the death of a parent. And some of these programs are indicated programs. That is, they're provided to parents of children who are already showing signs of behavioral and mental health problems, as uh, Representative uh, Napolitano was speaking about in her early remarks. All three types of programs have been tested in well-controlled trials and shown to be effective in preventing children's behavioral health problems. Let's quickly look at some of these programs. These are just the ones that are approved on the blueprints list. The blueprints, I think, should be the underwriter's laboratory of prevention science because the blueprints group applies a set of evaluation quality standards that provide assurance that the model and promising programs that they identify have been experimentally proven in well-controlled trials to have effects that you see in the column under impact. Note the wide variety of behavioral health outcomes that can be affected by helping parents build their capacity to build secure and responsive relationships with their children. On the left column, note in parentheses the ages at which these programs have been proven effective, starting from pregnancy through the child's adolescence. The Incredible Years Parenting Program, which you see highlighted, is highlighted because you're going to hear more about that program today from several speakers. And from early on through childhood, it has shown important effects. Now moving up to childhood, what you see, some programs like Incredible Years have shown positive effects across four different racial or ethnic groups. But some programs are designed specifically for families from specific racial or ethnic groups, like the Strong African American Families Program that you see on the third program down on this listing. That focused on building African American caretakers' capacity for protective caregiving. That program strengthened positive parenting and youth self-regulation. And there's now evidence from that program that it affects biological systems like low-grade inflammation and stress hormones in ways that protect against the adverse physiological effects of early exposure to disadvantage and adverse experiences. And yes, there are programs for parents of adolescents that work. Familias Unidas is a program for Spanish-speaking families of teens that you will hear more about today. 
Note the broad effects of that and other programs even offered during the adolescent period to parents. The last two programs on this list are indicated prevention programs for youth at risk of out-of-home or institutional placement due to caretaker or youth behaviors. Again, note the wide-ranging effects produced when programs provide skills and tools for positive parenting, even in adolescence. The Washington State Institute for Public Policy has been able to do an analysis of 10 of these 16 parenting programs. And they have found that eight of the 10 programs they looked at have positive benefits to families, children, and society in comparison to their costs. Incredible Years Parenting Program has a cost-benefit <laughs> ratio according to the Washington Institute of Public Policy of $1.89 for every dollar we invest in it. Strengthening Families 10 to 14, a program for parents of adolescents, has a benefit cost ratio of $3.78 per dollar invested. These are good investments in the future of children and of our society. And yet the reality is that very few parents come to these programs when they're offered in clinical, I mean in, in uh, community or school settings. Uh, a study done by Richard Spoth and colleagues uh, found that when they offered this to people in the whole community whose children were the eligible, eligible age, only about 18%, 17% of them actually participated. And in other programs, the rate of participation is only 4 to 6%. Why aren't people going to these programs that have been tested and shown to be effective in preventing the problems that their children may develop if they don't participate? Well, one is social stigma. When people hear that there's a parenting program and people want them to go to the parenting program, I think, well, I'm not a bad parent and I don't want people to think that I'm a bad parent, so if I go to that, I don't want to get labeled as such, and so I think I'd rather just not go. It's a little, little scary for me. Also, people are often not sure that the organization providing these programs is really has much more knowledge about parenting than they do. My middle school is offering this parenting program, uh, but you know they have a lot of parent problems with behavior management. I'm not so sure that they know any more about parenting than I do. Or my early childhood education center, which has been suspending kids, is now telling me about parenting. I'm not so sure that they know what to do. And so we have this problem that we need a trusted and legitimate professional home for family-focused prevention programs in America. I would submit to you that that might well be primary health care. We have had a revolution in health in the last few years. We have had the passage of the Affordable Care Act, the Children's Health insurance program, Medicare expansion, all these focus on prevention and population health, and they increase health access to health care for all families. The Bright Futures guidelines from the American Academy of Pediatrics is now institutionalized in the Affordable Care Act, and it provides opportunities through well-trial visits for screening of children and interaction with parents and the physician in primary care settings. And then developing idea of medical homes where families and physicians and primary care providers work together in partnership to promote the healthy development of children uh, are coming more and more into our society. So why would we think about doing this in primary care settings? Well, first of all, today, primary health care is accessible, almost universal, and relatively affordable with the current, current health care provisions. Secondly, pediatricians and family physicians have high credibility, they're trusted by parents, and they can validate and reinforce good parenting practices. And perhaps most importantly, services provided in a primary care setting are non-stigmatizing. Nobody's stigmatized when they go to their pediatrician or thinks anybody thinks they're a bad parent if they go to, to their pediatrician. Everyone with a child goes to primary care, and that means that this is a place where I could go and get the services I need as a parent without worrying about being thought of as a bad parent. In addition, we know that if we help parents, we are helping children. So in these medical homes where people are getting services together, we have the opportunity to promote both the well-being of parents and children. We also know that a child can be a motivating factor for behavioral change in parents, like stopping smoking which is both good for both the health of the parent and the child. 
And we think that these advantages could create high recruitment and retention rates in parenting education positive parenting programs. I told you earlier that it's about 17% of parents participate when these things are, practiced, are provided in a community or school setting. What if over 40% of parents participated in a needed parenting program? You're going to hear from Ellen Perrin about a program that did just that in a primary care setting later in, the, in, in this uh, presentation today. So I want to leave you with the belief that the, educa that the evidence is growing. Supporting healthy parenting in primary care is becoming increasingly feasible, and there is beginning to be good evidence that it can be effective in promoting the healthy development and wellness of young people. The study that mentioned, uh, the report that Denny mentioned earlier coming out from the National Institute for Children's Health Quality is uh, going to be released on May 5th, and that report talks about the promise of providing social emotional learning in primary care settings. There are a number of organizations that are realizing this is the time and place to move forward towards a new vision for our nation. That's a vision in which pediatric and fi family practice primary care providers prescribe preventive interventions from a tiered menu of proven family-focused prevention programs, and in which participating in proven family-focused prevention programs through primary care is a shared parental expert expectation for promoting their children's physical and behavioral health. Thank you. <laughs>